Well, good afternoon, everybody. I really very much appreciate you all being here um, this afternoon. My name is Leanne Dubois, and I um, chair the Rural Economic Development uh, Committee. Uh, we're part of the Economic Development C Committee here in James City County, and I'd like to shout out to Russ Seymour back there. He's uh, with our James City County Economic Development Authority. Um, so the rural economic development, we, with economic development in James City County, we started recognizing the fact that there are, that actually agriculture is the largest industry in the state. Uh, agriculture and forestry are a $79 billion industry. And many times communities don't always recognize agriculture as being economic development. And of course in James City County, we all understand how beautiful this is and the unique character that it has. And a lot of it is um, attributed to agriculture and forestry land. And they play a large role in economic development, not only the act of, you know, the, the farming, but also the open space that they um, provide. So the Rural Economic Development was created um, under the EDA for the purpose of identifying, encouraging, and promoting viable rural land uses, opportunities for the working, working lands. So as that, um, we were fortunate to receive uh, a grant from um, Ag and Forestry Development. And today's presentation is um, part of trying to assess and really understand what the economic impact and the opportunities are for rural lands in, in our community. Right now I'd like to introduce, we do have members of our rural economic development. Um, if they, you wouldn't mind standing, Andy Bradshaw, Pam Dannon, um, yeah. And Mark Rinaldi is here today. So these are some of our, our, our members who've been working towards these goals. Um, and we, um, in, we're also pleased today, I would like to introduce uh, Stephen Verson. He's a colleague of mine at the Department of Agriculture, and he administers the Ag and Forestry Development Grant. And so if he could kind of give a little overview of ag the AFID grants, which James City County was one of the first round of grants. So um, if you don't mind coming up, tell a little about. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Leah, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Stephen Verson with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. My job there is to administer uh, what we call the AFID grant, and that stands for the Governor's Agriculture and Forestry Industries Development Fund. Let me give you a quick background on that program, kind of how it led to us being here today. So for years, the ag and forestry community uh, felt a little left out. Here they are, the largest industry in Virginia. But for a number of reasons, that industry was never able to benefit from any, uh, typically any state economic development programs. Most of the state's economic development efforts were focused on traditional industrial recruitment projects. And for a number of reasons, ag projects got left out. They were too small, the jobs were too few, the wages too low or most importantly, they were hardly ever competitive between states because they're place-based. So one of the big accomplishments of uh, McDonald's administration and Secretary Haymore, who was the secretary in McDonald and, and the McAuliffe administration, was the creation of this new AFID grant, the Ag and Forestry Industries Development Fund. There's two parts to the program. The first part deals with economic development projects that are related to ag and forestry. So anybody that's gonna be adding value to an ag or forest product could receive uh, would be eligible to receive a grant from the state without any of the minimum thresholds that had previously kept so many of the projects out. And that, that was, a, we were very proud of that and we've had some great projects from it. But as a companion piece to that, we also created the AFID Planning Grants Program. The idea was, with both these programs, was how can we help, how can we have the maximum positive impact on agriculture using a small amount of funds? Ag is just too big to give money away to any producer and have a significant impact. So the idea was how can we partner with localities and strategically invest that money to have the biggest possible impact. With the AFID Facilities Grant where we're partnering with localities to help build sawmills or slaughterhouses or sandwich manufacturers or dairy facilities, what we are doing is creating new and lasting markets for, and hopefully growing markets for our agricultural producers. With the AFID Planning Grants Program, what we're trying to do is help improve the environment that ag and forestry operate in. The policies that our localities have towards ag have a real impact on their ability to thrive. And localities that are proactive in thinking about agriculture 
as part of economic development, is, is making that a central part of their economic development strategies are going to be more successful. So with the creation of the AFID Planning Grants Program, what we hope to do is take a little bit of funding and catalyze a conversation between the agricultural community, economic development, and planning to see are there projects we can pursue that make sense for all of us. And one of the things we really hoped that would come out of this would be uh, we'd see counties start looking at agriculture and forestry, not just as something that happens in the background till the next housing development or the next factory comes in, but really as a central part of that community's economic development strategy. And we hope to see local, countywide, ag and forestry economic development strategic plans. And when James City County came to us saying that, hey, we want to pursue that, we were thrilled to death that they wanted to pursue it. But then we were also a little nervous because this is, we were asking kind of to do something that no one had really done before much in Virginia. There weren't that many, hardly any strategies, economic development strategies for ag and forestry. So we really didn't know what one looked like, and we really didn't know who was going to do it. We just knew we wanted it. So when James City County came forward and put out an RFP for consultants to carry out this work, we were very pleased, as, as they were, with the tremendous selection of quality uh, consulting firms that came forward. And we were particularly pleased that Ed McMahon and his group became involved with this project. And so i just really here to congratulate you all on the good work you're doing. And this is groundbreaking work for Virginia. This is the first, you all the farthest along of any community with one of these grants. And we hope to be, that this will be the first of many similar projects around the state. You guys are really creating the model that we hope a lot of our other communities will follow, where you are taking ag and forestry very seriously, you're working collaboratively between planning, economic development, and the ag community, you're bringing in top experts from outside and coming up with a plan that is going to strengthen the community, strengthen agriculture, and improve everyone's quality of life going forward. So thank you very much for being here, and thank you for uh, your effort with this project. So um, thanks, Stephen. That's way to put it. So, um, so we are, we're very happy about the progress that we've made. And um, we've done some stakeholder meetings here in the community. We found out we have a tremendous market here. We have one of the largest wineries, the Williamsburg Winery. We have a forest industry. And these, like um, Stephen was saying, were, talked about were a little marginalized until this project has kind of brought them forward. So we're really happy. We're about, you know, close to the end of the project. Uh, we have a, a great plan of work from agritourism to agriculture to opportunities for local foods to farmers markets. Um, all these things kind of are part of the landscape of our, our rural economy here. So we'll, we do have a website that we've just developed and you're welcome to, to go to that. It's off of the economic development website. Um, to show a little bit about our projects. Um, right now, we're, we're just trying to just get an, uh, an inventory of agriculture projects in the community and identifying new opportunities for new business ventures that will protect the land base, and um, all to um, celebrate the uniqueness of James City County. So today, I'm um, very pleased to be able to um, introduce Mr. Ed McMahon. Um, Mr. McMahon is an attorney, a community planner, a lecturer, and author. And he is currently a senior resident fellow at the Urban Land Institute in Washington, D.C., where he holds the Charles Fraser Chair for Sustainable Development. He is nationally known as an inspiring speaker and leading authority on topics related to sustainable development, land conservation, smart growth, and historic preservation. As a senior fellow for sustainable development, Mr. McMahon leads the Urban Land Institute worldwide efforts to conduct research and educational activities related to environmentally sensitive development policies and practices. Um, before joining the Urban Land Institute in 2004, Mr. McMahon spent 14 years as the Vice President and Director of the Land Use Planning for the Conservation Fund in Arlington, Virginia, where he helped to protect more than 5 million acres of land of historic or natural significance. He is also the co-founder and former president of Scenic America, a national nonprofit organization devoted to protecting America's scenic landscapes. Before that he taught law and public policy at Georgetown University Law Center for nine years and served in the U.S. Army, both home and abroad. So it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. McMahon. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lee and Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as always, driving down from Washington was less than fun. It took me uh, an hour and five minutes to go the first 30 miles outside of DC. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk a little bit today about the uh, rural economy, but you can't really talk about the rural economy in Virginia without talking about the economy in general, and particularly how it relates to urban and suburban uh, development as well, because it really is kind of a continuum. Uh, I work, as Le uh, Leanne said, for the Urban Land Institute. We are an international nonprofit research and education organization. We are devoted to fostering best practices in land use and development. I'll tell you a little story uh, before I get started with my program about how I got interested in wh you know, what I do for a living. And, and that really goes back all the way to the Vietnam War. And I was a young second lieutenant in the United States Army, and I had just finished uh, field artillery school and jungle warfare training, and I had orders to a small fire base in the central highlands of Vietnam, and I was getting ready to go. And about a week before, I'm supposed to fly off to Tan Sinut Air Force Base in Saigon. I get a call from this colonel at the Pentagon, and he's with the personnel division. And he says to me, Lieutenant McMahon, do you have any interest in being reassigned to Germany? And I'm like, OK. <laughs> yeah, let me think about that. Germany or Vietnam? Yes, Germany sounds very exciting. I would love to go to Germany. And I got extraordinarily lucky. They sent me to Heidelberg, West Germany, which is the headquarters for the US military in Europe, and also one of the most beautiful small cities on the planet. And I was assigned as an aide to the United States General, and then I spent the next two and a half years of my life flying all over Europe in a helicopter. And that experience completely and totally changed my life. But I didn't realize quite how much it would change my life until I flew home to Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up. And I got out of the airplane and drove home, and for the first time ever, I saw the American landscape with a completely different set of eyes because to travel is to learn. And that's what we try to do at the Urban Land Institute, is to learn from each other and from other places about what's working, what might work better in land use and economic development, real estate, and so on and so forth. So uh, we'll get started with that. And you know, when we think about uh, you know, James City County, you, you know, I'm sure you all think this is a very special place. And it is a special place. But what's interesting, when you start talking about the rural economy or rural preservation or rural anything, I can tell you this. One of the things we've learned is that uh, I'm going to need a little light on, I think, back there. I won't be able to see any of my notes if we have it completely dark. They had a way they were they could dim the lights. I don't know how they it would think it was in, the, in there. Um, you know, think about, you know, the, the transition from rural, you know, in 1960, Tyson's Corner was a small rural hamlet at crossroads, if you will. Uh, today, it is the largest edge city in the United States. In 1950, what was the, the most productive agricultural county in the United States? It was Los Angeles County, California. In 1960, the most productive agricultural county in the United States was Orange County, California. So my point is, what is rural today will not be rural tomorrow by accident. You know, you actually have to, you know, in a rapidly growing region, in a rapidly growing state like Virginia and the Tidewater, you got to actually think about how to keep rural places rural. They just don't stay rural by accident. And the other thing you need to think about is that the world is changing very fast. And I can tell you that people all over this state, particularly, you know, in rural areas and small towns, don't like change. But I want to tell you the other thing we've learned is there's only two kinds of change in the world we live in today. There's planned change and unplanned change. You know, you can anticipate change. You can prepare for change. You can shape and direct the change that is coming, or you can just let it happen. You can grow by choice, or you can grow by chance. You know, uh, you know, which kind of change do you think will result in a community that you will like better? And what we've learned is that unplanned change simply destroys every single thing people love about the place that they live. It changes everything. 
So, you know, Abraham Lincoln used to say that, you know, best way to predict the future was to create it yourself. And that's kind of what this, I think, rural economy study is all about, trying to think about how to plan for a rural economy, how to keep people on rural lands, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it just doesn't happen, as I said before, by accident. So today, we're really going to talk about this. We're going to talk about our children and our grandchildren and the future and planning for the future. We're also going to talk about balance because this is really what any program like this is all about. It's about how do we balance conservation and economic development, jobs and the environment, the built environment and the natural environment. So balance is pretty important. We're also going to, I'm sorry this is so it's kind of hard to see, it's kind of, we had a problem with the computer getting this to focus better. But the, the other one is that, you know, we, I believe we spend way too much time, certainly in Virginia, fighting about what we disagree about. And not nearly enough time sitting down together, community by community, to talk about what we do agree about. You know, who could be against something that was good for business, good for the environment, and good for the community. And that's what we try to do is figure out sort of those win-win solutions that are sort of good for everybody. And what we figure out, find out, is if you actually sit down together and talk to each other, uh, you find out that there's an incredible amount of agreement. You know, I I've also found out that there's only one place in Virginia where nobody listens to anybody else, and that's called a public hearing. You know, people go to public hearings, they have their minds made up, they talk past each other. So you need to have a forum for dialogue, sit down to talk to each other and try to focus on what you agree about. So, you know, a couple of the things that are changing that you have no control over, which is why you need to anticipate and prepare for the future. How about the national and global economy? How about demographics? How about technology? How about consumer attitudes and market change trends are changing dramatically? And I'll show you some examples of that in a few minutes. Healthcare, you may like it or not, but the healthcare system is changing, okay? How about energy prices and sources? You know, we are switching from, you know, a, a energy-based economy based on coal, primarily, to natural gas. And it's largely to do with the marketplace, because we have found out we have so much natural gas, it's become cheaper. Did you know that every single county in West Virginia, except one, is losing population? And the one that's not is Jefferson County. That's a suburb of Washington. That's the panhandle of West Virginia. Well, you can sit around and moan about the end of the coal economy, or you could actually prepare for a different kind of future. Do you want to spend all your time investing in Kodak stock, or you want to think about where the world is going? And that's what you have to do when you think about any kind of economic development. So let's think about some of the changes in employment. You know, we are basically shifting from an economy based on manufacturing to economy based on services and, you know, professional services. Today, in 60 of the 100 largest cities in the United States, the largest employer is a hospital or a university. So think about Richmond. What's the biggest employer in Richmond? It's Virginia Commonwealth University. When I grew up in Birmingham, our biggest employer was the United States Steel Company. It doesn't exist anymore in Birmingham, Alabama. Today, the biggest employer is the University of Alabama Medical Center. 27 hospitals in one place, employs 150,000 people. The whole world has changed in communities like that all over the United States. You know, there's a guy named uh, Richard Florida. He's written a bunch of books. One was called The Creative Class. He has a new one out. It's called The Great Reset. It's about how the Great Recession is reshaping the American economy. And he says how we live, work, shop, and move around is going to change. And the communities that embrace the future are going to prosper, and those that do not are going to decline. And we'll give you some more reasons wh why we need to be thinking about that. So let's think about education. So when I graduated from college, co a long time ago, college graduates were evenly distributed throughout the United States based on population density. We had the same percentage basically everywhere, you know, but that's no longer true. Today, college graduates are clustering in certain metropolitan areas, in certain sm cool small towns. So you go to D.C., and in the metro area, 47% of everybody has a college degree or higher. But you go to West Virginia, it's 18%. You go to Las Vegas, it's 19%. You know, think about a city like Raleigh-Durham. Their entire economy used to be based on furniture, tobacco, and textiles. 
three declining industries. And all the young people were leaving. Today, they have an economy based on technology and education because they had three great universities. So they decided to try to work together. And they created the largest research park in the United States called the, tri tri the Triangle Research Park. So let's think about how economic development is changing. It used to be all about cheap labor, cheap land, cheap gas. You know, the rural economic development strategy in Alabama when I was growing up was well, let's just widen all the highways. That was our strategy. And then we would line all the highways with a bunch of junk. You know, so I want to tell you something. That strategy doesn't work anymore. Today, it is not about shotgun recruitment. It's about laser recruitment. It's not about cheap labor. It's about highly trained talent. It's not about low cost positioning. It's about high value positioning. It's not about, you know, what you don't have. It's about what you do have. You know, and the most important infrastructure investment today is not roads anymore. It is education. Education. And, you know, we used to think quality of life really didn't matter in the economic development, you know, discussion. Today it is critical. It's what sets us apart. And I'll talk about this. If you cannot differentiate James City County from any other county or in America, you will have no competitive advantage. So that brings us to this idea of asset-based economic development. You know, economic development is about choices. You know, do you want to try to bring in some kind of new industry? You want to examine closely what you've already got and build on that. Economic, so think about this. You know, we already, we have 3,141 counties in the United States. We have 25,000 incorporated communities. They're all in competition for, you know, a few hundred plants, factories, or distribution centers. We build any more in America every year to do anything. How many people are being really successful in that competition? So what we're saying is you need to think about what you already have once again. Now, let me show you some examples of the way we used to think about economic development. It was always about the one big thing. So first, we had an arms race in almost every city in America to build the biggest convention center. And of course, most cities will never win that arms race. And then it was festival marketplaces, which worked fine in Baltimore and Boston. But did you know that we also built festival marketplaces in downtown Richmond and in Norfolk, and they went bankrupt, along with 19 other cities that did try to copycat logic the same thing? And now, then it's, now it's like casinos and amusement parks and like aquariums. Okay, so even a place like uh, Camden, New Jersey, they said if we could just build an aquarium, you know, featuring the fish of New Jersey, <laughs> then we could save Camden, New Jersey. Well, they did build that aquarium. It's a very nice aquarium. Did it save Camden? No, it did not. Because successful economic development is almost never about the one big thing. It's usually about lots of small things working synergistically together off of a plan that makes sense for you and your community. And so that's why this this program, this study is so important. It's like really thinking about what kind of rural and agricultural assets that you might have. So asset-based economic development really begins by really thinking very, you know, really getting below the surface and thinking about what you've already got here that you could build on. And you know, you have a lot of great things, assets in this county, you know. I've listed a few of them here, farms, forests, natural areas, open space, the city of Williamsburg. The James River, William and Mary University, Thomas Nelson Community College. I mean, these are all assets that you can build on. You don't have to recruit them. You're not in competition with anybody else for those particular assets. So let's talk a little bit about farming and agriculture. You already heard from Stephen uh, and Leanne that you know, agriculture is the largest industry in the state of Virginia. What's the second biggest industry? It's tourism, OK? which also is part of what we will talk about uh, today. You know, and so what we're going to try to think about is, you know, just think about wineries. We had six wineries in the state in 1980. Today we have 130, okay? Uh, just think about 200 now. Is that what you said? 200. It's gone up. I, uh, these are out of my statistics are out of date. 200. Farmers markets. You know that in the last 10 years, the number of farmers markets in the United States has gone up 500%. And we'll talk about what that might mean economically. 
So I want to say a little bit about this topic of agritourism. Now, a lot of people don't really understand what agritourism is. Uh, they, they have a very limited idea. Let me just give you the, you know, the definition is that people say that it's the business of establishing farms as destinations for educational and recreational purposes. So those are some of the kind of things that you people think about, things like crop mazes and hay rides and pick your own farms and horseback riding, et cetera, et cetera. But let me talk about there's really five kinds of agrotourism. First, on-farm sales of agricultural products. You know, one of the things that you want to figure out how to do in farming today is to eliminate the middleman eliminate the wholesaler. So if you can sell directly to the consumer, you know, that oftentimes is, makes more economic sense for farmers than having to sell through a middleman. So things like, you know, Christmas tree farms and pick your own operations and farm markets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a lot of other things. How about educational uh, tourism? Things like school tours, winery tours. That's become a huge business in the state of Virginia, winery tours. Farm work experiences. You know, I was listening to uh, NPR's Marketplace the other night when I was driving home from work, and they were talking about what is the most important asset that a young person uh, can bring to a job after college. And it wasn't their, you know, uh, it wasn't their degree. It was whether or not they'd had an internship, okay? And by the way, you know, most of our farmers in the United States are uh, over the age of 55. Well, I forget what the average is, but it's, but it's getting up. How do we get young people into farming, into agriculture? Well, one way is through giving them an opportunity to try it out. Things like entertainment, hay rides, corn mazes, petting zoos, haunted barns. The single most profitable farm in the entire state of New York is a farm in Red Hook, New York, called the Norman Gregg Farm. It's, a, it's in the Hudson River Valley. They make 100% of their revenue from agrotourism. 100% of their revenue. That's the most profitable farm in the entire state of New York. Well, what about accommodations? You go out to Loudoun County on the weekend, and that's where all the weddings are occurring now on the wineries out in western Loudoun County. You know, so, there, or, or in the Shenandoah. My son was married at a farm on the Shenandoah Valley last summer, a goat farm, okay? They make more money from the weddings than from raising the goats. But the, having the goats brought the people who wanted to have their weddings there, you know? So it, it's, it's interesting, the synergy between these kinds of things. Outdoor recreation, horseback riding, hunting, fishing, things like that. So there's a lot of different ways you can think about this. And, you know, uh, all of these kinds of things, I'm sorry I, I went through. So, you know, the, all of, so, so think about this. On-farm sales, educational tourism, entertainment, accommodation, outdoor recreation, et cetera. Those are all the different kinds of things you might do. In fact, New Jersey did a study, which you can download. They actually have a PowerPoint you can download off of the Internet about agro-tourism in New Jersey. Now, I thought New Jersey had sort of a parallel to James City County because most of New Jersey is either urbanized or suburbanized or it's, or it's what we would call urban edge agriculture. And certainly, you are urban edge agriculture. You're, you know, right between, you know, Richmond and Hampton Roads. You know, this is basically a community that's a suburban community by and large. So, you know, it turns out that 52% of all the farms in the state of New Jersey generate a significant amount of their revenue from agritourism. And 36% of all the farms get 100% of their revenue from agritourism. Who would ever think that was, you know, so it's not just from growing crops, it's from a lot of other things you can do on the farm. And then there's also things you can do that are sort of off the farm, you know, and let's, I want to talk about one in particular. I want to talk about farmers markets and, you know, farmers markets, these are the stats from the U.S. Department of Agriculture on the growth of farmers markets from 1994 to 2013. Essentially, that is a 500 percent increase in the number of farmers markets in the United States. And the reason farmers markets have become so popular is because they're both good for farmers and good for consumers, you know? And so that they provide a way for essentially the farm, farmers to bring their products to market, as I said, once again, without having to go through a middleman. And it's also a way to introduce urban populations to a sort of what farming is all about. Where does their food come from, for example? 
Now let me just show you, you know, this is, oh, this is out of order, but this is, uh, let, me, let me come back to that. So this is uh, the little town I live in. This is Tacoma Park, uh, Maryland. Tacoma Park's the oldest suburb of Washington. It was laid out in 1883 uh, by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And we have, the, one of the, we have the oldest farmer's market in the Washington region, other than Eastern Market, which was a permanent uh, market on Capitol Hill. And when we started uh, back in the 80s, we had six farmers and we only had a handful of consumers, okay? We are also the only Sunday farmer's market in the Washington region. The reason we're a Sunday farmer's market is because Tacoma Park for many years was the world headquarters for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And they have their services on Saturday and their big church is in downtown Tacoma Park. So we had our farmer's market on Sunday. Well, what's interesting about the Tacoma Park Farmer's Market is that today it is, it is a major, like, scene. If you want to go and, like, you know, you know, just have some really interesting entertainment on a Sunday morning, go to the Tacoma Park Farmer's Market. But what happens there is we have thousands of people who are now keeping 20, we have 30 vendors uh, and we, who come from 23 different farms. They all have to be within 75 miles of the city of Washington, D.C., okay? And we essentially, the small city of Tacoma Park, is keeping 23 farmers, primarily in the Shenandoah Valley or in southern Pennsylvania, in business. And they're selling directly to, you know, consumers, you know, who actually are relatively high income, who are willing to pay a premium for fresh fruits and vegetables and freshly baked bread, flowers they bring in, all kinds of things. And it's a great experience for young people. It's just really part of the social fabric of our community, as well as very good for the agricultural community as well. Now, here's another thing that's happening. Now, some of you may have heard a story on NPR a few weeks ago about how farming is becoming the new golf. You know, we actually have uh, 15,500 golf course communities in the United States. And the reason the development community built golf courses and then surrounded them with houses is because they figured out they could charge a lot premium for a house that was next to a golf course up to 30% up to more than the exact same house not next to a golf course. But guess what? Did you know that the vast majority of all buyers in golf course developments in America do not play golf? And so if you interview them and say, why'd you buy the house there? They'll say, oh, I like the view across the fairway. I like to live next to protected open space. Well, like, duh, what does it cost to build a golf course? Millions of dollars. What does it cost to maintain a golf course? Millions of dollars. What does it cost to leave the open space alone in the first place? Like almost nothing. So a growing number of developers are starting to build golf course developments without the golf course. And here is an example. This is in Loudoun County. It's a project called Willisford. This is the fastest selling subdivision, new home community in the Washington suburbs. It, this community is designed not around a golf course. It's designed around a 300 acre farm. Okay. And they have all these things there. They grow 150 kinds of fruits and vegetables. They have, you know, they have chickens and, you know, eggs. They have goats who mow the grass uh, in the publicly owned areas of the development. They have bees for honey and pollination. They have a weekly community supported agriculture project uh, program. They have a market stand that's open three days a week during growing session. They have educational programming and farm events. They won the National Association of Home Builders Award for best community in the United States uh, last year. I recently saw another project. I was out in uh, Seattle and I got to go visit a project on Bainbridge Island, which is right across from downtown Seattle. You can take a ferry to work. And there's a project out there called Grow Community, just like Grow, G-R-O-W, just Google it, okay? So this is a community that is uh, within walking distance of the ferry terminal. And what they did was there's 24 for sale houses and there's 120 apartments in four plexus, four unit apartments, okay? And what's unique about this community, first of all, it's, it's zero carbon. None of the houses require any, have, have no utility bills at all. It's all solar powered, every bit of it, okay? But what was more interesting was they, are, they don't allow any parking in the, in the project. I mean, that's kind of like unheard of, right? And they, but they have bike trails and walking paths to go through. Not a single house has a garage. They all have attached bicycle sheds. And the, each of the, every four houses is clustered around a community garden. Now that's all kind of unusual in the U.S. sort of home building landscape. And so they actually couldn't get any bank in the Seattle area to give them financing for the project. 
But what happened? Okay, well, they sold all 24 houses in less than six months in a sluggish real estate market. They have filled up every single apartment. They have a waiting list of 1,000 people. And they're getting a premium. They're getting the highest rents per square foot on Bainbridge Island, Georgia, I mean, Bainbridge Island, Washington. And now the banks were falling all over themselves to finance phase two of this project. Now, if you live there, you don't have to do any of the gardening. They actually have a person, a, a person they have hired part-time to be in charge of the community gardens. But people, he does program. What do, you, what do you want, the neighbors, what do you want me to grow in this garden? Oh, I want, you know, f all these different kinds of fancy herbs and this kind of stuff. And then there are other people who actually want to get their hands dirty and they are in the garden. So this idea of sort of farm to table. We had a program at one of our meetings recently, uh, which was in Denver, Colorado, that I moderated. It was called Real Estate and the Food Revolution. Real Estate and the Food Revolution, okay? So there were three people at this, uh, all real estate developers at this program. So one of them is the guy who runs the ferry terminal market in San Francisco, okay? The ferry terminal is a, you know, was right at the foot of Market Street. The Embarcadero Freeway used to be right in front of it, but it collapsed in an earthquake and they didn't rebuild it. And they have this beautiful boulevard there now in front of it. The ferry terminal market has a farmer's market, like a European food hall. It is the fifth biggest tourist attraction in the city of San Francisco. It earns $1,250 a square foot, okay? Because food and foodies have become like a national revolution. People are like all into food. I couldn't believe this. If you go, into, you go to D.C. or go to Norfolk or something, and when I was a young person, like we didn't go out to dinner for entertainment. We just like went and sat in the car and drank beer or something. But you now see these young people, now they're all out at these restaurants, you know, and that's kind of how they spend their time and their money. Food has become sort of, you know, part of like the entertainment.